Hello, today we are going to talk about validity in epidemiological studies. Well, what if you come across one day a headline in the newspaper that a study says that coffee drinking doubles the risk of heart attack? What is going to be your reaction? Well, in order to further go into in depth into this study, we will actually need to look at how this study was done and how valid are the results of this study. If we look at any epidemiological study, the basic goal of any epidemiological study is twofold. One is to obtain an accurate estimate of whatever is being studied, whether that is the frequency of a disease or the effect of an exposure on a health outcome. And all of this we study in a certain sample of the population. Now, this aspect of any epidemiological study is known as internal validity of the study. How valid are, are the methodology that is being used to either estimate the frequency or determine the effect of an exposure. Now, in the long run what we would want is we won't want that this estimate is generalizable to the relevant target population among which the study is being done. Now, this aspect of any epidemiological study is known as external validity. So, that the results of the study can be extrapolated to the whole population. When we talk of accuracy of the estimate, what accuracy actually means? It consists of two things, precision and validity. If we look at uh, say uh, a bull's eye and we want to hit the mark, what we would want to be is to be precise in uh, and as well as valid. So, that we try to hit the bull's mark as many as times as possible. So, it's similarly every epidemiological study can have results which are both precise and valid which is what we would actually want in every study. However, there could be studies where the results may be precise which means that every time the study has been done you get the similar results, but it may be that the methodology was not correct and so they are not valid. It may happen that the results are not precise, but sometimes they may be valid or in the worst case scenario the results may, ne may be neither precise nor valid. So, when we are looking at any epidemiological study we need to be uh, wary of both precision as well as validity. As I told you in epidemiological studies all that we are doing is basically estimating. We are estimating either the frequency of a disease or a health outcome or we are estimating what is the effect of an exposure on an outcome. Now, when we are doing these estimations there are bound to be errors that may happen in our studies. There are two kinds of errors that we come across when we are doing epidemiological studies. One are called random errors or errors that happen due to chance which is basically the variability because of any unknown or uncontrollable causes such as errors in sampling or errors in doing measurements. However, the more uh, problematic error that we may face in any study are called systematic errors or biases. These are the errors that are basically a threat to the val to validity of any epidemiological study. And how do these errors uh, happen in any study? Basically, the way we do the study, the methodology that we uh, use to do an epidemiological study and if it is uh, done in a certain way that tends to produce results that are not the true results, then that leads to errors which are called biases and ultimately what we would see is that either the estimates or the associations that we are trying to assess between the exposure and the outcome in the study sample may differ from the true causal association between the same exposure and outcome that may be there in the source population. So, let us look at the various kinds of biases or threats to validity in epidemiological studies. There are essentially three kinds of biases that may occur in any epidemiological study. These are called as selection bias, information bias and confounding. So, let us go through one by one. Coming to selection bias. Selection bias happens when uh, we use procedures to select populations. Remember that in an epidemiological study we are sampling a certain number of individuals to participate in the study. The way in which we select these study participants, are we sure that these study participants really accurately represent the target population and if there is any issue in which the way we select these people that results into what we call as selection bias. 
Now, how do all these things happen in epidemiological studies? Remember that we are selecting our cases and controls and these may happen through either we are using a surveillance mechanism from which there is a systematic notification of cases and if we are taking more of exposed cases from the surveillance mechanism that could be one way in which uh, selection bias could occur. Uh, we may be screening and doing diagnosis more systematically among the case, uh, those who are exposed if we know their exposure history beforehand and then that can artificially in, uh, create biases. Uh, again selection biases can occur in if we select our cases and controls from healthcare facilities, hospitals and where if it is likely that more of the case patients who are exposed are admitted or the other way around that can lead to selection bias. <coughs> uh, another common way in which selection bias occurs is when we select those cases who are alive. The cases of the disease who are dead uh, would not be uh, part of our studies and it may be that the reason why these cases are alive ha may have to do with the exposure status and hence selective selection of survived patients can actually lead to selection bias. In cohort studies, selection bias usually occurs when there is a loss to follow. Remember that we have to follow up people over a period of time uh, in cohort studies and if it is likely that people who are less exposed or more exposed, they are more likely to be lost or people who are at more risk or are letter, lesser risk, if they are more likely to be lost to follow up, that eventually can lead to results that are biased and that would be attributable to selection bias. How do we deal with selection bias? We can deal with selection bias at any stage of our study. Ideally, we would want to make sure that the way in which we design the study is free from selection bias. So, one way would be to use incident cases and not prevalent cases because prevalent cases have the issue of survival bias. Especially uh, case control studies are more prone to this uh, to selection bias and various ways in which to deal with selection bias in case control studies is to use population based design rather than hospital based design such that the cases and controls are actually selected from the community or the population and not from few or a particular healthcare facilities. We need to make sure that we apply the same eligible criteria when we are selecting cases and controls and we are not leaning towards a particular uh, exposure among the cases and controls. Again, both the cases and controls should undergo the same diagnostic procedures and the same intensity of surveillance in order to identify them as cases and controls so that we are not biased in the time of their selection. Now, at the time of data collection, what we need to ensure is to minimize non-response. Uh, to minimize non-participation and make sure that we do not lose many people, uh, especially in cohort studies over a long follow-up period. Even if we anticipate, we should anticipate actually that we may lose people and so it would be a good idea to actually keep a record of all these losses, uh, people at least some basic socio-demographic characteristics of these people so that later on at the analysis stage, we can actually compare people who were lost to follow up versus those who remained in the study and see if there were any, any major differences in these two populations which could lead to selection bias. We also need to make sure at the time of data collection that the diagnosis of disease is not affected by the exposure status, which means at the time of selecting who the cases and controls are, the person who is selecting the cases and controls should not be aware of what the exposure status of this population of the cases and controls are and this one way in which we do this is called blinding. Now, at, even at the analysis stage where if uh, what we can do is as I told you before, we can compare those who responded or to those who did not respond, those who were dropouts compared to those who were left in the study with respect to the baseline variables and see if there are any large or small differences between these two groups large difference, if we find large differences, it is suggestive of selection bias. However, small differences uh, do not rule out selection bias. So, we need to be wary of that. Again, another way to assess whether there may be a, a selection bias may have occurred in our study is to do what we call as sensitivity analysis in which we try to do an analysis uh, assuming 
how much bias could have happened and what direction it could have gone and try to see how it affects the study results. If the study results are affected in a major way, then we can assume that yes selection bias has occurred. Moving on to the next threat to validity and that is called information bias. Information bias is essentially a bias that can occur when we are measuring uh, the characteristics of study participants. Now, what do we measure? We measure exposures, we measure outcomes and we measure other variables which may influence the exposures and the outcomes which are called as third factors or confounders or modifiers. What we need to uh, make sure that the measurements that we are doing accurately represent what it actually is. The level of exposure is accurately measured, whether there is an outcome present or absent is accurately measured and other variables such as socio demographic age, gender, uh, other e education, ex income, all those variables are also ap appropriately measured. Now, how does this happen? Now, in case control studies, information bias can happen if we are collecting exposure information which is leaning towards a particular exposure status. If we are like trying to collect more of people who are exposed compared to the unexposed or the other way around, uh, this can lead to information bias. One of the very common ways in which information bias occurs in case control studies is through the process of recall. Remember that we have cases and controls and we are trying to re we are asking them to recall the past history of exposures. And it may be it may so happen that those people who are diseased or who have a certain health event may be more likely to recall certain exposures compared to those people who are healthy. And this is what we call as recall bias. It may also be possible that better exposure data is available on cases compared to the controls and that again can lead to information bias. In cohort studies, information bias can happen if we collect information leaning towards a specific outcome status. If we follow the exposed population much more rigorously compared to the unexposed population, that is something that can lead to uh, information bias in cohort studies. Uh, it may also be possible that better outcome data is available among the exposed and then again uh, compared to the unexposed, which can again uh, produce information bias in the study. Information bias can be introduced in a study both either by what the investigator does in the which in the way in which uh, the investigators collect the information about the cases, about the controls, about the exposure, about the uh, uh, about uh, uh, whether they get the disease or not get the disease and if there is a systematic way in which this is being done. Uh, irregularly that can lead to information bias. And last but not the least of course, remember that in, in, in general in observational epidemiological studies, we are dependent on what our study participants tell us and if there is a, any systematic distortion of the true facts by the study participants that is anyways going to lead to information bias. Now, how do we deal with information bias? First of all, because we are measuring the exposure variable, the outcome variable and the other variables, we need to set up precise operational definitions of what we are going to measure and uh, how much is it going to be. We need to have detailed measurement protocols in the way we are going to measure each of these variables. Sometimes it is also a good way to do repeated measurements on key variables say for example, blood pressure and we know that blood pressure can vary from time to time. So, we may take more than one readings of blood pressures and then take an average of that reading in order to say what the actual blood pressure of that individual is at that particular point of time. Uh, it is very important that the investigators are trained and certified in the way in which they follow the study protocol and all the methodology that needs to be done to collect information. There we can do data audits both of the interviewers and of course, of the data management centers where the data is stored to in order to make sure that the way in which the data is collected, the data is retrieved, the data is stored is, is done uh, correctly and there is no information bias happening because of the same. Once the data is collected, we need to make sure that the data is cleaned, we need to go through the data both visually as well as maybe through computer programs, softwares and make sure that we are getting clean data. 
it is also a good practice to actually rerun all your analysis before you are trying to do give say send your paper for publication just to make sure that you are not uh, uh, that there is no possibility of any information bias occurring because of the way the analysis was done. Now, we are going to look at the next threat to validity which is called confounding. Confounding comes from a French word which actually means confusion of effects. Now, what effects are we talking about here? Remember what we are doing in epidemiological study is looking at the effect of an exposure on the outcome whether if you are more exposed are you more likely to get the disease or vice versa. Now, there it so we what we want to know is the effect of this exposure on a particular outcome. Now, this effect can be confused with the effect of a third factor which can have an influence both on the outcome as well as the exposure and this is what leads to what the phenomenon of what is called confounding. Now, what does confounding do? Actually confounding is probably the most uh, the biggest threat to validity in any epidemiological study because confounding can actually simulate can show you an association even when it does not exist. Confounding may hide an association that is actually there or confounding may actually increase or decrease the strength of the association. So, you may say that an exposure is more associated with the outcome or less associated with the outcome than what it actually is. And in the worst case scenario confounding can actually change the direction of an effect. If uh, an exposure say causes an outcome because of confounding you may see that the exposure is preventing the occurrence of that outcome and that is the most dangerous threat to validity in any epidemiological study. So, how does confounding happen? So, diagrammatically what we represent that confounder is a third factor is a variable which influences both the exposure and the outcome. And when we are trying to uh, determine what is the association between the exposure and outcome this association is influenced by this third factor. Now, we can deal with confounding both at the design stage and at the analysis stage. It is always better to deal it with the design stage than to uh, take care of the analysis stage. So, at the design stage one uh, we can do several things. One we can do what is called restriction. We can restrict our study participants to only those people uh, who are in one stratum of the confounder. So, that the confounder cannot play a role in the association between exposure and outcome. Secondly we can do what is called matching. If we already know what the potential confounders could be for in a particular study we can match our cases and controls on those particular confounders and which will uh, negate the effect of the confounder and then the, the association that we see between the exposure and outcome would be without the influence of the confounder. Of course, remember that if you do matching you have to do what is called matched analysis. In experimental studies we do what is called randomization and that is something that actually automatically is takes care of uh, the confounders and make sure that uh, the two arms in a randomized trials are similar in all ways uh, in terms of the confounding variable. Now, at the time of analysis what we can do in a we what we need to do in every study is to actually first test whether there is any confounding or whether there are variables which could be acting as confounders which need to be taken care of at the time of analysis. And this is where we do what is called stratified analysis and we stratify our data on in various stratum of the confounder and then uh, try to find associations and which helps us to identify whether there is confounding or not. Now, in order to take care of these confounders we can do what is called a multivariate analysis uh, wherein uh, we do we use regression techniques whether it is logistic regression, linear regression or other, met other advanced methodologies in order to uh, take into account the effect of confounding and then the associations that we get between the exposure and outcome are without the influence of the confounder or as we say adjusted for the confounders. So, how do you evaluate associations? Whenever you see a study, whenever you see a, so when you see a risk ratio or an odds ratio, what you see is a crude association. Now, how do we make sure that this 
crude association is actually the true or the causal association that is the true relationship between the exposure and the outcome. What we need to make sure is we need to go through this spiral. We need to make sure that it is not because of chance. We need to ensure that there is no selection bias. We need to check if there's any, there could be any information bias. We need to understand if there could be confounding and if that confounding has been taken care of. Only after going through this process, we would be able to say that whether the crude association is actually the causal association or not. So, coming back to our problem, does coffee really increase the risk of heart attack? Well, let us analyze this. What we, the, if the what we wanted to do is to look at all population, all adults in the population who are drinking coffee. Now, in the study what we get is a sample of people who agreed to take part in the study. Now, these people could be more uh, people who are more likely to drink coffee or less likely to drink coffee. These are these people uh, may be hospitalized patients and if those if you are doing a study in a hospital and it may be that these patients are hospitalized for say, say gastric ulcer and that is because of coffee drinking. So, the way in which uh, we select these participants can actually lead to a bias and uh, that is what is called selection bias. Now, what we are the exposure that we are trying to assess here is the coffee actual coffee intake of the study participants and what we get from the study participants is actually what they report. Are they reporting the true coffee intake? Do they actually remember how many cups of coffee they have had in the past? What is the average number of coffee they drink? whether they drink coffee with milk, without milk, what is the strength of the coffee. All of these issues can actually influence whether the coffee intake that we are measuring is actually the true coffee intake and that can lead to information bias. Again remember that we are also trying to see whether the people really had a heart attack or not. And it is possible that uh, there may, be have, may, may have been a misdiagnosis of a heart attack, there could be other the chest pain that the study participants may report as heart attack may actually have been maybe due to other causes uh, and that is reported as heart attack. So, actually what we may be seeing is not heart attack, but some other causes for chest pain and that is again uh, the study results would then be influenced by information bias. And then of course, there is confounding. Could it be that this association that we saw between coffee and heart attack what we call myocardial infarction in, say, in medical terminology, could it be confounded by smoking? Is it possible that those who are, we know that those who are smokers are more likely to is a known risk factor for heart attack. It is also known that those who are smokers are more likely to be coffee drinkers and it is possible that because uh, we may see more of smokers among the coffee drinkers and more of smokers among those who had a heart attack, the association that we are seeing between coffee and heart attack is not due to the actual coffee, but it is actually because of the effect of smoking on heart attack. And so, there is uh, the results of this association between coffee and MI could have just been confounded by the effect of smoking. So, what we need to understand is that there are various threats to validity in any epidemiological study and these biases can occur in all epidemiological studies, more so in observational studies such as case control and cohort studies and less so in randomized trials. Biases can occur during all stages of the study when we are designing the study, if the study is not designed appropriately, if the study is not conducted appropriately or if the analysis is not done appropriately, all of which can lead to one or the other biases. And we know that biases threaten both the internal and external validity. Remember that this a study which has no internal validity cannot be generalized and so it does not have any external validity. So, what do we, we need to keep in mind is that when we are designing a research study, we need to be thinking of all the possible ways in which these various biases could creep in into our study and design it appropriately and try to prevent as many biases as possible for, uh, at the time of designing and implementing the study. However, we should also remember that there could be some biases 
which cannot be avoided. What we need to understand is at the time of analysis of the results, we do need to be aware of what these biases could have been and state these biases in the form of limitations of the study. So, it is critical that whenever we look at the results of any epidemiological study, we need to be wary of what possible threats could be to the validity of these studies and make sure that the investigators have taken care of these various threats. Thank you.